presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. A federal judge is poised to hear arguments on the case to save Idaho salmon. We'll discuss the state of salmon recovery in the Northwest. Join the conversation. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. In 1991, the sockeye salmon was listed as an endangered species. In the two decades since, we taxpayers have spent about $8 billion trying to save this amazing fish. Before we begin our discussion, contributing reporter Aaron Kuntz looks at ways agencies are working together to track salmon and steelhead. It's a cold day along the Clearwater River near Orofino. The water level's high and fishing isn't easy. It's late spring and these sportsmen have their work cut out for them, casting their lines under the massive Dwarshack Dam in the early morning light. For as long as we have records, uh, people have been fishing, utilizing these resources, and it, w it was a very important part of the culture and society. Pete Hassamer is the fish manager in Idaho, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. He explains the journey is far from easy. Approximately 1,600 miles round trip that begins in the Snake River for the sockeye salmon and the clear water for these juvenile steelhead. These juveniles going out, uh, the only way they'll come back as adults is that they survive that entire part of their life cycle. And so the first part of that is when they encounter these reservoirs and the lower snake and the Columbia, how we move them past the dams, um, how they survive that migration and, and passage down to get to the estuary and eventually into the ocean. The numbers of both sockeye and steelhead have dwindled over the years. In the early 1990s, only a handful of salmon survived the trip to the Pacific and back. In 1991, sockeye salmon were listed as endangered. The steelhead listed as threatened in 1997. Between then and now, three states and the federal government are working together to monitor and hopefully reverse the rapid decline in numbers. We actually, just downstream from here, about 100 yards, we have a, a passive detection system that these fish will be um, observed at. And we can take that data, we plug that data into the Columbia Wide database and uh, it's there for everybody to share. Idaho fish and game biologists monitor fish by radio tagging them before they head downstream. Here along the potlatch, fish and game officers use traps like this weir. State officers scan them for radio transceivers and check the available data to monitor their movements, then return them to water. Without putting pit tags in, we really have no way to identify these fish and their history. Senior fisheries tech Nick David says detection sites register pit tags when fish swim past radio receivers like this one, barely visible in the muddy waters. This detection site in Julieta, just 20 minutes from Lewiston in Idaho, is important because they can now gauge how effective the recovery efforts have been. There are similar projects going on in Washington and Oregon, so we can start to compare our successes on a, a larger geographic scale, in this case the, the regional scale, that's the Columbia Basin system. And so this small stream here is part of this overall Columbia Basin monitoring effort and strategy. Perhaps one of the most controversial issues, dams that were built to generate clean power for those in the Northwest, disrupting a natural flow and creating an obstacle for the salmon and steelhead. Anything that we do, it seems, affects something. And, and you know, these fish are, for years, have been able to migrate through the hydro system and, and make it back to the natal stream. Environmental groups like the National Wildlife Federation asked a federal judge in 2006 to increase the water flow, making it easier on salmon who struggle to make it over a dam. 
but utilities like Bonneville Power Administration says that causes a loss in power generation worth hundreds of millions. And then there's the landscape. More homes along the river have caused changes in the water flow. This, uh, this river system is in fairly poor condition right now. It's an intensively monitored watershed. And we're doing a whole lot of habitat restoration projects to try to improve the health of, uh, of the stream, therefore improving the health of the migratory run up here. Fish managers are working with private landowners to improve habitat. Sakai also faced the threat from climate change. Dams provide clean power to the Pacific Northwest, an ethical dilemma for some environmentalists who on one hand want some dams torn down, yet struggle with the desire for clean energy. There is no silver bullet yet that's going to solve everything, uh, but we're certainly making advances in recent years and, and some of the responses we've seen in the fish populations have been positive. While biologists continue their work to recover salmon and restore some critical migratory habitat, policymakers work through a virtual maze of political and legal backlash. In about two weeks, Federal District Judge James Redden will hear the next round of oral arguments in the salmon recovery case. What are the key issues? Is what we're doing working, or do we need to rethink how salmon are going to be saved? Joining us to talk about salmon recovery are four guests. Tom Stewart is board member of the Idaho Rivers United. Tom, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, Jim. Vincent Kozakovich is the Columbia Snake River Office Department <coughs> Program Manager for the Bureau of Reclamation. Thank Deputy you for being Program here. Manager. Deputy Program Manager. Okay. And, and uh, hopefully I came close to getting your last name right. <laughs> also joining us tonight is Jim Norton, a filmmaker whose documentary on salmon will air on the PBS program Nature on May 1st. Jim, thank you for being here. Thanks. And also joining us is Russ Rowe, fisheries research scientist with the U.S. Forest Service's Rocky Mountain Research Station here in Boise. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you, John. And of course, we want to hear from you. Give us a call toll free at 1-800-973-9800. Well, let me toss the first question out just to get people updated. What are the key questions that are becoming up before the oral arguments with the judge in a couple of weeks? Uh, uh, Joan, I can start if you like. The, uh, the, the, the biggest question is whether or not the, uh, the federal uh, salmon management plan, the biological opinion, uh, complies with the Endangered Species Act or not. That's fundamentally where we are. Um, there are some sidebar issues that we can talk about in whatever uh, detail is appropriate as the program continues. Um, one is uh, where, where should the bar, the, the bar be set? What, what's, the, what's the standard for, for recovery? What, uh, uh, what should the, the, the federal agency's goal be? Uh, how is the science uh, going to be uh, evaluated and how is consensus science going to be reached? That's an issue I think that will come before the court. Um, the issue of um, interim measures, are we doing enough now? Uh, to, uh, to, to, to keep uh, the salmon from uh, declining further and perhaps to move toward recovery as the uh, Endangered Species Act requires. And um, uh, what do we do if, the, uh, if, if what we're trying now fails? So those are some of the major issues I think will come up. Does that jive with what you're... Well, like for the legal issues, I think you just need to look at the legal briefs because there are a lot of esoteric things in involved. Uh, one, this is not a... ESA recovery plan, which is covered by Section 4. This is a Section 7 consultation. NOAA Fisheries has issued a biological opinion uh, to see that we've complied with Section 7A2 of the Endangered Species Act. Russ, could you perhaps take us back a bit and give us some historical trends? What are we, when we talk about the decline of salmon, what are we talking about? Yeah, I think it would be useful for your viewers to have a perspective. Um, historically, the Columbia River Basin, which the salmon and snake in Idaho are part of, was the most productive Chinook salmon habitat in the world. Uh, there was an estimated two to six million Chinook that returned annually to the snake system. As late as the 1880s, when we know uh, excessive harvest and some other factors had already caused declines, there were still an estimated one and a half million Chinook that returned. In 1995, there were less than 1,200 spring summer Chinook that returned to the system. So that's the period in the early 90s when the, the listings of all these stocks occurred. And Jim, let me ask you, why take up this particular topic? What is it about salmon that made you decide you want to do a film on this topic? Uh, well, personally, I got interested in the story working as a guide here in Idaho in the Frank Church and Selway Bitterroot Wilderness is on the middle fork of the salmon, the main salmon and the Selway. Uh, more broadly, it's such a rich part of our iconography 
in Idaho and in the Pacific Northwest uh, was such an important component of the natural and ecological wealth in the region. And um, when I started to get interested in salmon and by extension interested in the causes of their decline, a lot of what became interesting to me was less the by now very familiar portfolio of insults to natural systems, whether it's dams or development, uh, but also how we try to save. And that's very much what uh, our project is about. It's not so much looking at the present conflict in terms of the specifics of the debate, one side or the other. It's looking at that conflict as a, uh, in the context of of a story that we've been telling ourselves for now over 100 years about our relationship to these fish. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at a, a clip from the program that airs. Now, reminding viewers that this program will air May 1st, that's Sunday, uh, nationally on PBS, and you can see it here on Idaho Public Television. Let's go ahead and take a, a, a quick look at a clip. About a billion dollars a year are now committed to Columbia River salmon recovery inspiring extreme measures to protect the investment's return. During the salmon run, boats patrolled the width of the Columbia below Bonneville, trying to drive sea lions back to the sea. In 2008, 35,000 non-lethal cracker shots, rubber bullets, and seal bombs were fired at one protected species on behalf of another. Fish that escape predation and enter the ladders pass by the counting window at Bonneville. Here we measure how well they and we are doing. Lately, about a million fish a year, both wild and hatchery born, travel past the window. That's less than 8% of an average run 100 years ago. The consequences of that decline are going to prove ever more devastating. Let's go ahead and go to our first caller. It's uh, Glenn in Chalice. Glenn. Hey, how you doing, John? Good. Yeah, I was just wanting to get your guest take on what we're doing to protect the salmon and what's being done to keep them off the threatened slush and Endangered species list. Okay, Glenn. I think well, let's let me see if I can paraphrase. How how about this? What are we doing currently to save salmon? If you can give a very brief rundown, and how successful is it? And we'll toss that question out. Well, a lot has been going on for the uh, protection of uh, of salmon throughout the Northwest. The uh, action agencies that are defendants in this lawsuit have uh, been in collaboration with other federal agencies, state agencies, Indian tribes. Uh, state governments, county governments, uh, local watershed groups, uh, putting together uh, projects to improve the survival of uh, salmon and steelhead. The action agencies in collaboration with others have uh, gone into a very lengthy process of uh, developing uh, methods of improving survival through the hydro system. We're taking a, a, a broad approach. As Mr. Hasmer said on the opening fil film clip, there's no silver bullet here. The, uh, the best way for, for us to, or the, the most cautious way that we can move, move forward is to uh, attack problems on all fronts in collaboration with uh, many partners. Uh, John, I could uh, piggyback that a little bit. You know, the um, the, the federal uh, agency uh, framework for salmon recovery for 15 years at least has been what's called the four H's. You know, it's a habitat referring primarily to the uh, spawning and nursery habitat that central Idaho has, has, has loads of. Um, harvest, which uh, details how many fish are caught and how they can be caught selectively and what those numbers are and what the impact is on survival rates. Um, the um, uh, hatchery system, which has been used uh, dramatically over the last 30 to 40 years to try to uh, mitigate and replace for some of the, uh, uh, the losses of salmon that have recur occurred for various reasons. And, and fourth is, is the hydro system, which is the, the system of uh, 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 dams and reservoirs between Idaho and the Pacific. Now a comment, uh, I think Pete Hasmer in the movie said, uh, 
that there is no silver bullet, but in those in those 4-H's, we got some really big bullets, then some that are much, much smaller. And, I, I, and I don't, I, that's a point I think that has to be made, and that's a, a point of contention from uh, those of us uh, uh, on the challenger side of this lawsuit that think the federal plan is currently insufficient. We think the priorities are a bit misplaced, inappropriate. Most of the damage that's uh, done to Idaho salmon runs occurs in the dams and reservoirs downriver from Idaho. So we don't think that sufficient uh, steps have been taken to mitigate that. And that's what's going to come before the, among the that's issues? One that's one of the issues that will come before, before the, the judge. judge, yes. Why is, I, why is Idaho such a good place for salmon? What is unique about Idaho and its salmon population? There's several um, different qualities that our fish have that are unique. Um, one of the things that we have that's very unique in Idaho is we have intact, high quality connected habitat. Um, in the Snake Basin, there's still over 3,000 miles of good, excellent habitat. And really the core of that is within central Idaho, within the Frank Church River No Return Wilderness. Within that area, we have large land bases where natural processes still function. This creates a, a physical template for the expression of a lot of life history diversity and genetic diversity. So that intact habitat that's connected, uh, a range of elevations, a range of stream sizes, gravel sizes, really allows for that expression of life history diversity. So one of the points for the Middle Fork stocks, at least, is habitat is not limiting those populations. The second thing that's unique about Idaho salmon is we still, within central Idaho, have wild, genetically distinct fish. Wild populations of salmon in the uh, Columbia Basin are very rare. Only about 4% of the historical range of spring, summer Chinook still contains wild fish. Everywhere else, they're either extirpated or they've been influenced by hatchery stocks. And within the Middle Fork, our research suggests that we still have, within tributary differentiation, so in other words, the fish that spawn in Lower Big Creek differ from the fish that spawn in Upper Big Creek, as well as across tributary differentiation. So Big Creek fish differ from Loon Creek, from Camas Creek, et cetera. So again, that's very unique in the Columbia system. Uh, hatchery fish are not a negative influence on those Middle Fork stocks there. A third point is we have really unique qualities of these stocks. Um, the Middle Fork fish travel one of the longest distances outside the Yukon. They travel about 800 miles from saltwater, and they spawn at the highest elevation in the world of any spring, summer Chinook stock. Our fish are spawning in some of these upper basins above 6,000 feet elevation. Um, in addition, we have real diverse life history. Um, we have a range of freshwater ages from less than a year up to two years, and then we have a range of saltwater ages from less than a year up to five years. And you, you put those together and there's potentially 18 different age classes that contribute to a single year spawning. So spreading the risk, so to speak, and that tremendous diversity allows these fish to adapt to a really dynamic environment and, and, and adapt to changing conditions. The fourth point is they have very high resiliency. And resiliency is basically ability to withstand negative conditions and ability to respond positively when conditions favor them. And from 2001 to 2003, we documented about a four to five fold increase in adult returns to the Middle Fork. And there were two factors that influenced that. One was there were improved migration conditions. There was more flow, faster travel time through the migration corridor. So more fish survived to the estuary. And then when they encountered the estuary, the ocean conditions in those years were very good. They were excellent ocean conditions. So those two factors in concert allowed that response. And so that type of resiliency suggests that if we can address strategically the factors that have limited those populations, they will in fact respond. So, the, so we can save the salmon? The, the take home message is it is biologically it's feasible possible. to recover them, provided we strategically address the factors that cause their decline in the first place. And again, to reiterate, for those middle fork stocks, habitat's not limiting, Hatchery fish are not in, introduced to the system. We know that harvest rates on the fish from coated wire tags are relatively low. There's been no legal wild sport fishery in Idaho for 33 years. So it's really the outside basin factors that have caused the decline in those particular stocks. And Joan, for what it's worth, I think that's uh, <clears throat> what uh, uh, the perspective that the challengers in this lawsuit uh, have, uh, have in mind. Um, the, the basic concept is that the um, 
priorities uh, are, are not properly placed in the federal uh, management plan. Uh, we need more emphasis in the migratory corridor. You know, a fundamental um, uh, threshold in the region that's been observed for a long time is you know, a target uh, survival rate for, for the smolts going out to the ocean to the adults coming back. Uh, from Idaho needs to be about 2% minimum. The uh, target should be about 4% on average with about 2% minimum the target. And um, we haven't achieved that uh, in, 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 on average uh, in decades. I want to uh, give Vince a chance. Well, that's true. We haven't mm -hmm. because we haven't recovered and the fish aren't being delisted. Mm -hmm. However, we have, are making progress in, in, in doing that. Uh, Reclamation is uh, not involved directly, so I'm, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of my right. uh, my partners. The, but the uh, the collaboration that they then each year they come up with uh, and sit down and work with developing what the spill program is going to be. Okay. We have yet to see any adult returns f since the uh, the last installation of the surface passage which was put in 2009. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, uh, let the system work. Uh, you look at the studies that, that show that uh, you know, survivals have been increasing. Mm -hmm. You reduce travel time. The, uh, the federal agencies have been working in, in conjunction with the state managers, the, the, mm -hmm. the tribal managers, and every year is different. Mm -hmm. You have high flow years, you have low flow years. There are many things that impact that. We do know that uh, we have done just about everything that you can do to improve survival from the f one side of the dam to the other. There is mortality that happens from with, within the system. Uh, we need to look at w ways of reducing that in, uh, mm -hmm. and w we are working with states, tribes, and other, yeah. other parties to do as much as we possibly can. I, wa I want to ask Jim yeah. a question. As you, were, as you were putting your document together, you were, you were trying to tell a story. What do you want people to take away from the story? Well, I want people to just be willing to explore the set of assumptions on which our approach to managing salmon is based and draw their own conclusions. Because our project is really, it really is a story about a story. And it's a story that we adopted in our first intersection with salmon over 100 years ago. We as a society? As a society. And you know what you saw in that minute-long clip and what these guys are talking about and what really gets to the heart of the caller's question is we're doing everything for salmon uh, at every single stage of their life cycle. We incubate them in plastic bags and raise them in tanks and drive them downstream in trucks and barges, protect them from their natural predators, find incredibly creative and complex and expensive ways for them to pass over dams. And when you go out and talk to people who are working in each of those contexts, everyone is trying to do the best they can in that context to improve salmon survival. It's really now that we're 100 years downstream of of that initial set of assumptions that when you pull back and look at the, the collective context that things are arguably uh, absurd. And, and I think a, a very extreme expression of that is what we saw there in that clip where we're trying to chase sea lions back to the sea. Um, and, and so I hope that just people will explore whether whether what we're producing is really what we set out to save. Mm -hmm. we're, and I apologize, we're rapidly running out of time. It goes by very quickly, it's half an hour. If you're on our phone lines, stay with us. We'll get to your calls when we flip over to our web extra, so don't hang up. We'll get to your questions. But I, in, the, in the short time, we went, I want to throw mm -hmm. one question out. Is there hope of restoring wild salmon back mm -hmm. to Idaho's streams? Is that the legal goal we're trying to accomplish, or is that the pie-in-the-sky goal we want to accomplish. I, I can start with that, Joan. Um, 
Well, the goal, I'm, I'm, I'm an Idaho citizen, so of course I have a very parochial interest in restoring Idaho salmon, and, and I do that for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, uh, Russ uh, spoke to this. Idaho salmon are unique. You know, we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, what I would consider the Olympic champions of the salmon universe. Um, no, um, no f other fish on the planet migrate so far and so high in their migration home. So these are these are special. These are un unique critters. They're worth saving, and it is possible to save them. Um, we've made some progress in recent years, um, uh, due uh, in part to some of the habitat improvements and the reconnectivity that we've done in Idaho habitat. The major, uh, the major contribution, however, in, in my opinion, and the, and the scientists that I trust, has come from spill. Uh, spill, which is a practice of, of passing water uh, in, in, in spring and summer um, over the dams and through the reservoirs to operate those um, industrial canals more like natural rivers. Uh, and salmon benefit from that. They, 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 that's a proven benefit. Um, with all due respect to Vince, and he doesn't make this policy, I realize, but the federal agencies have resisted spill all the way, and they, uh, uh, they, they, they seek to reduce it now in certain contexts. So that'll be a battle before the court as well. Um, we think sport, the, the current spill is, is, is a floor, not a ceiling. It should be enhanced for anyone who's serious about keeping uh, dams in place regardless of their value. Well, like I said, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. we have been collaborating with the with the co-managers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research being done also to determine what are the uh, the, the best methods. And uh, when you're, when you're talking about spill or flow and and water travel time, that's only one aspect mm -hmm. of mortality that occurs from the middle fork of the, of the salmon to the ocean. Uh, there are many other factors that, that come into play, uh, non-indigenous non species, for example, rates of predation, disease, uh, toxins, number of things. We have about 30 Agreed. seconds. On okay, um, yeah, in answer to the question, there definitely is hope. I mean, as I tried to point out, right. we have some really unique qualities of these fish. We've got good habitat, we've got genetics, we've got diverse age structures and, and life history diversity, and we have evidence of response, uh, high resiliency. Um, so I guess my cause for hope would be that we focus on the real causes of mortality and we're strategic about those. And I would also say that there are legal definitions of recovery, but recovery from an ecological standpoint is recovery to populations that are gonna have ecological benefits to the suite of species that depend on salmon. They are, in fact, the keystone species. And Jim, I'm afraid I have to let All you right. have your final say in the web extra. Okay. We have run out of time. I'd like to thank our guests, Tom, Jim, Pleasure. Vincent. Appreciate, appreciate you all being here. Thank if you. you have more information about salmon recovery on the Dialogue website, go to idahoptv.org. Jim Norton's documentary, Salmon Running the Gauntlet, airs on Nature on May 1st. That's nationwide. You can see it here on Idaho Public Television again Sunday, May 1st at 8 p.m. I also invite you to become a friend of Dialogue on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in and join us here next time for Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.